The Sheila Zielinski Show, the only show to give you the truth behind the headlines, prophecy, and the deeper things of God. Now, here is your host, Sheila Zielinski. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday edition. It is Thursday, February 16th, 2017, and it's great to be on the air today. We've been trying to sort out some technical issues. It looks like our podcast is allowing us to upload now. So the podcast is now available. The archives look like they're working. Everything looks like it's working. So thank you, everyone, for being patient while we were trying to iron out some bandwidth, etc. Hopefully, we're not going to have any more issues with the website. Now, the podcasting was a whole different issue to sort out our bandwidth. So all these good, fun, technical things. Thanks for being patient while I work through that. Hopefully everyone got to listen to Tuesday's show, the non-Valentine's. I don't really celebrate Valentine's Day. So, of course, it was February 14th. Had the honor of being one of the first people to read Steve Quayle's book and had the privilege to be the first person to interview Steve on that book. What a what an amazing show that was. He just has such an amazing heart. What a guy, what a guy. I just love this new softer side of Steve. I'm loving that. It's so awesome. It's always a pleasure and a blessing to have him on the program. So do go back in the archives and don't forget to to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And what's cool, if you subscribe to the YouTube, we're going to be doing, God willing, we're going to be doing some new things this year, some video, taking some interviews to the street. We're going to be doing a lot of fun new things, doing some contests and having some new amazing guests as well. So make sure you subscribe because that is one of the things I really would like to see is me build my YouTube channel. Most people know my original one got taken down and that's a whole show unto itself. But without further ado, I want to jump right into the program because I have two fantastic guys, young guys, up and comers. I'm really impressed with their knowledge, their ministry, and it's really a pleasure to have them on the program for the first time it is. Chris Taylor and Rory Brown from Don't Let Them Burn. There's a title. Boy, oh boy, these young guys are really having an impact on the younger generation. I'm, again, very impressed with some of their work. And as some of you know, I recently... I was talking about this on air. I recently went to Dr. Strange. I was shocked because here I had three sons that were always into comic books, and I never gave it a second. I never even gave it a thought until my my first red flag was when I watched Captain America when that came out. And then I started getting more and more red flags as the themes that were emerging in Marvel. And, of course, I knew how sinister Disney was. So when Disney bought out Marvel... And then the icing on the cake was when a few months ago, I saw Dr. Strange. And let me tell you, I knew it was time to do something exposing this devilish underbelly that is the DC Marvel superhero world. So to kind of get into more of this, and I think they just do such a great job because they're knowledgeable. See, I haven't read comic books like these two, so I'm so excited to bring them both on. Chris and Rory, welcome to the program. Just start off telling the listeners a little bit about your ministry. Oh, thank you for having us. Um, My name is Chris Taylor, and we've been charged by God, I think, to expose a lot of things in entertainment and also to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and and to show people how much all of this correlates to the end times at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And me and my partner, Rory, have had our own spiritual experiences, so we speak from that angle too. Rory? And like he said, we've had some experiences um, dealing with the dark side. I have, uh, and also Chris. But the most important thing that we want to do is show you the dangers of the world today. Show you the dangers that are going on in, it could be in comics, it could be in movies, whatever, in entertainment on a whole. And a lot of people are just going headlong and don't really know what's, what's going on before them. So this is what we are about. I have to tell you guys a funny story. So I do a 30-minute breakdown. Actually, that and it's years. It took Really, when you think about it, it took me 
eight years of shows, when you think of little things in your head and you remember topics on, you know, whether it was Steve Quell and Tom Horn, and I'd remember things that Mike Hoggard would say about symbolism and you tie it into little creatures and Disney and conversations I've had over the year. And I did a breakdown after looking at a YouTube video. It was, I think it was Replacement Gods, and I made some notes and I tied it all into my own research. I wrote a book on the underbelly of the occult and the green gospel. Green gospel is what my book is called, and it really gets into the Agenda 21, Agenda 30, the underbelly of the United Nations and how that insidious global peace ties in. But what's interesting is a guy came out and said, oh, you plagiarized from a book in 2007. I thought, I wish I saw a book in 2007. I wish I know there was a book called Gods in Spandex. Apparently, I picked the same title of an actual book. And had no clue. I, I've I've never plagiarized from any book. But, you know, when I walked out of the Doctor Strange movie, let me tell you, Chris and Rory, I was stunned. And that's what really, because my boys, my three sons, are big comic book fans, that's what really spurred me to, I was thinking about the WikiLeaks and the Thelema and the Aleister Crowley and the Aldous Huxley and the Doors of Perception and Stan Lee. And all of a sudden, when I walked out of that movie, I thought, I have got to do something on this, especially tying in all that spirit cooking from Wikipedia, the Marina Abramovich and the movies. So you're right. The entertainment is straight. That heli weird is straight out of the pit of hell. So I'm really glad that we're going to expand upon this a little bit more today because you nailed it when you said the entertainment industry. Boy, that is the underbelly of hell itself, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things I learned in my research, like you said, is that the entertainment industry follows us from we are babies till the day we die. They have something for each and every one from the day you're born till the day you die. Well, you know what the most stunning, and I only touched on this in the YouTube video, I call it Gods in Spandex, the Secret History of Comic Books. And the reason I did it is because I really wanted to show how these ancient deities tie into some of the themes of these comic book superheroes. Stan Lee let's face it, did not get his original idea just from his head. So I really wanted to kind of lay that out for people, but I also wanted to lay out the occult piece of this. And you're right, like we are absolutely inundated from the time these kids are, you know, right out of the womb, they're watching the seemingly benevolent Walt Disney. And I did a a couple shows on just how insidious Walt Disney being, of course, the 33rd degree Mason in the Thule T-H-U-L-E, into Thule. Hitler was a member of Thule. High-level satanic society that all these guys were involved in. Disney, let's face it, has been eluding a, you know, generation after generation. And boy, do they ever have some demonic overtones, and especially the subliminal messages. It is frightening, isn't it, Chris? Oh, yes. And, you know, you talked about Hitler and the Thule. And what about the real society and, yes. and, and the demonic teachings that come out of these societies, uh, the Kabbalah and the New Age? These comic books, the video games, the movies are filled, littered with the teachings from all sorts of people. But, you know, Jack Kirby, Aleister Crowley, these people take their, their, their teachings from the old gods. They create the new gods for us as a society to basically bow down and worship. Even though we're not literally all bowing down to worship them, inside of us, we have this, what some people would say, this empty hole that that God needs to fill. So we take that need for the hero and we reach out to the Supermans and the Spidermans and the Ironmans and the Avengers. And so tonight we want to um, break down some of these characteristics and some of the theology and the doctrines that are being taught in them. I'm going to just hand you guys a mic. And just lay this out for us, and I'll jump in when you're ready to give it back. Oh, sure thing. Uh, so we could start with Superman, the Ubermensch, which Nietzsche talked about. As we talk about the Superman and his, his origins, he, he wasn't... The powers that he has now is not what he started off with. He was just a guy that would leap over tall buildings and fight gangsters and, and thugs and things like that. Um, but now, with the new incarnation of the Superman, we have what is the evolution. And when you look at the movie Man of Steel, you'll find genetically modified babies in the Genesis chamber, which comes from the secret planet, the secret Krypton, crypt, secret, right? And and what, what do we find throughout all these comic books? The secret knowledge, the gnosis, just the same thing you find in all these secret societies. And Roy, before I go on, do you want to interject? 
Chris, before we even move on to some of those new things that you're talking about in, in the movies, one of the things I, I notice about Superman is that uh, most people don't know this, but before he had the S on his chest, it was actually a serpent. And one of the things that they do is the serpent is always being pushed forth in everything that happens. So most people don't know that, but that's where he actually started from, or that was a part of his costume, and it was changed over time. Well, we talked about the genetically modified babies in the Genesis Chamber in, in the movie Man of Steel. Well, the villain of the movie Zod reminds Superman in this vision, where he's actually inside of his head, reminds Superman that the genes of the entire race is grafted into his cells. And his destiny is to wipe out humanity and start a new race. This is what the Superman, the Ubermensch idea is all about. Then we have Jor-El, which is a, basically an AI. But you have to look deeper than that because it's a transfer of consciousness. In the movie Man of Steel, Jor-El says that his consciousness is basically preserved so that he could teach his son. And <laughs> the constant theme that you'll see in um, the TV show for Superman, Smallville... And then uh, Superman Returns is the theme of the world doesn't need a savior. And, and you know what? To, to touch back on the part that you talked about, the S, you know, at first I didn't believe that the S was a dragon or a serpent. But then I saw somebody wearing the shirt on a, on a movie talk show and it was a blatant day. It was a serpent, a dragon right there on his chest. And so we go from Man of Steel, which I could, you know, I could spend a lot of time on that. But let's go to Batman versus Superman. And so in Batman versus Superman, you know, it's Batman, the spirit of vengeance against Superman, the God man. And we have the tie in with Lex Luthor. Now, the peculiar thing about Lex Luthor is he is a caricature of Aleister Crowley. And many people don't know that. But if you go and read the book, Our Gods Wear Spandex, you will find out the truth about Lex Luthor, the iconography of him. And in Batman versus Superman, he's talking about if man can't kill God, then the devil will. And he looks at Superman also as a messiah type figure, which he is, but I really equate him more to the Antichrist. He taunts Superman talking about other gods, and he, he mentions, uh, I think he mentions Jehovah and how he's going to wipe him out. And the one, one little part before um, I stop there on Superman is so, there's something in there called a mother box. This is what they use to give Cyborg his powers in the movie anyway. But the mother box is an interdimensional portal device that allows gods or supermen, superhuman beings to come through to our earthly realm. And you see in the deleted scenes of Batman versus Superman that Lex Luthor is contacting through the AI in the ship, one of the gods through the mother, and he's showing him all the mother boxes. So it's just something very interesting to think about with Aleister Crowley, how he contacted beings, how he cursed God and all sorts of things. Go ahead, Rory. Well, and what I have experienced with Superman, I played the game. I played the video game. Actually, my kids were playing the video game. Superman versus um, versus some of the other superheroes. So, so he was Batman. And, and the things that were put in those games that you would see them as they were made to be as gods. And the art that was in there was to defame the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the the things that were there in that game were so horrible that I actually had to tell my kids, hey, we got to get this out of here. You know, you will see the symbol of the church, the cross is there, or some of the other things that are, are just laden in these games. This is what I was saying before. They actually start indoctrinating the child's mind from the child is very young. And this goes on as we grow older, and, and it takes shape in the movies where you see Superman is now put as a god. One more thing, Chris, before we move on. The last movie that came out, Superman, they were saying that churches should use Superman to replace Jesus Christ, to explain Jesus Christ. And I was astonished to see the imagery putting him on that pedestal as a deity. And I, I said, how could this be? Why would they want to do this? Because this is the intent from the beginning. This is what they want to do. They want to put Christ down, the Lord Jesus Christ, and raise up the beings like Superman, Batman, the spirit of vengeance. And the other thing is Batman. He's not doing 
anything out of his heart being good. He is just avenging because the blood of his parents was spilled. He's going out and fighting crime, taking vengeance on people, but not necessarily to free people. And that also is another way that it's being put forward to people and nobody even sees that. It's true. (laughs) It's very true. (laughs) You know, when you think of the spiritual climate that we're in, you know, I just want to go back to this book here and, and read something from out of it. Claiming possession by a spirit named Iwas, Crowley wrote Lehar Al, the book of the law, in which he prophesied the age of Osiris. Let me pause there. I told somebody years ago that this superhero invasion is part of the ushering of the new age, but they didn't believe me. And so the book goes on and says the age of kings and churches is passing and the age of Horus will be born in fire and blood. In it, a new race of self-willed supermen will emerge to purge the world of the weak and the weak-minded. Compassion is the vice of kings, stamped down to the wretched and the weak, Crowley wrote. Then, quote, this is the law of the strong. This is our law and the joy of the world. Now, what does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like Darwinism? And this is one of the other main themes that runs through these superhero movies, just like uh, X-Men. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. You see, a lot of these characters are in and of themselves just an idea passed down. And in other characters, they're repackaging of the old gods. Well, let me just throw this in there, guys. You know, I find it fascinating also that when you really do a deep study of Osiris and, of course, Horus and Anubis, the overtones, especially when it ties into, you know, Osiris being the god of the dead, you know, some of the Greek, the Titan characters, you have these overlaps, you know, whether it's Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, the god of the dead. So you've got overlapping deities there between the ancient Egyptian ones and the Greeks, but you also have it tying into Baal, who was an ancient Canaanite and Mesopotamian deity associated Mm -hmm. with fertility. So a tie-in there too, isn't there? Definitely. Absolutely. I also pulled up an article from the Telegraph from... Saturday the 14th, 2013. It talks about the Man of Steel. The movie was, uh, had just come out, and he says, are superheroes the new gods? And they were putting it forth to say that, hey, these guys are the people that we need to look up to. And they are talking about DC and Marvel having many movies coming into the future so that people will have these guys to look up to as their new gods. And we see that DC has has taken this dark role. And one of the things that you talked about, um, Chris, with the box, we're talking about interdimensional travel, that we see that same pattern in DC as we see in the Marvel that, that's coming forth. We're opening portals. Portals are being opened. Our stargates are being opened. And it's, it's repeated throughout all these different movies. And I think that's just amazing that people would actually sit down and have this stuff channeled to them. Oh, yeah. We're talking about Horus. Well, Superman uses the sun as his power. That's how he powers himself. There's no other way. And so that ties him directly to Horus and Mithra. Let me throw this in there. I have a writing on Aleister Crowley who believed he was the incarnate of, guess who? Horus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's so interesting. And, and so let me tie a couple of things in, right? So we have Samaramus, Tammuz, and Nimrod, right? Tammuz would be Cupid. Samaramus would be um, Diana, Ishtar, Isis. Nimrod would be more of the, uh, the, the ideal Ubermensch, right? Yeah. So... We go from there, we have the Black Madonna, where you see the woman holding the child. And we go from there to Horus, Osiris, and Isis, right? Think of Diana. She is the moon god, the fertility god. So is Ishtar, Columbia, as we just said. It's also represented in the movie Ghostbusters, which is also a comic book, as Gozar the Garzarian. And when you go back and look at that movie and the symbolism that's there on the, on the tower or her temple... You'll see all sorts of Masonic things like the phallic, the two phallic symbols, Jacob and Boaz, the two dogs of the underworld basically protecting her. And then we have the Hunger Games, which Diana is Katniss Everdeen. And in that movie, there's so much Gnostic overtones, even though it's not a comic book movie, it still relates to the Diana aspect of the moon god, the, the hunter goddess, right? And so 
coming back to comic books now, there's a trinity in the comic books. It's Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Yep. And Wonder Woman is Diana. Go ahead, Rory. So you brought up Diana. She was actually created, one of the first comics that came out was All-Star Comics number 8, 1941. On her chest, we see the phoenix. And at that particular point in time, she had a skirt. But one of the things I found um, quite interesting is that Diana, or Wonder Woman, was inspired by Margaret Sanger, great feminist. And she founder of had Planned a part. Parenthood, by the way. Exactly. Yes. And she had a part in the women's lib or the women's rights coming forth. So when you look at these comics, you say, well, oh, they're nothing. But we can see that these things have had an impact on society even until today. Well, I want to throw something in about Wonder Woman. This is very interesting, too. The Amazonian warrior pagan goddesses were very into witchcraft, by the way. Oh, yes. And and Wonder Woman has a magic lasso, which when she binds, when she binds anyone's body or spirit with it, they must tell her her the truth. All, All of this stuff is very blatant. It's in your face. But people in the church refuse to believe that this is what's going on. But scholars that know about pagan history, they say this is exactly what it is. Well, I thought it was fascinating, guys, that if you look at the creator of Batman, if you do a study on Grant Morrison, I read a couple of books. I was stunned that he actually said that he literally had a, a book from his uncle. He said that of Aleister Crowley when he was 16 and he started mm-hmm. summoning demons and then suddenly he got a lot of these ideas. Don't you find that fascinating? Then springboard into the Doctor Strange. Stan Lee does an actual cameo, says at the end of the movie in the credits that he was reading a copy of Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception. Get this. Aldous Huxley was actually introduced by Aleister Crowley, and they actually smoked peyote together, and they talk about this experience and what they summoned. It all just fits together, doesn't it? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, you know, Aleister Crowley is, is, has, is one of the people with the biggest influence on our modern popular culture. But right beside him, we could argue that Jack Kirby is one of the second fundamentally his whole belief was psychedelic and intrinsically pagan and so he knew a lot of deep occult knowledge yeah a lot of it you know i, I want to go into into x-men right now but the x-men have always been a, a allegory for you know bullies uh people that are outsiders jewish persecution but over the years it's turned into another sort of allegory which is homosexuality and so when, when you see the, the new iteration of the X-Men on film, it's an allegory for homosexuality. And you're, you're probably wondering, why am I saying that? Well, look at what Brian Singer, the, the director of X-Men, said in his interviews, that it's an allegory. And also the actor that plays Magneto, Ian McKellen, he said because of its uh, homosexual allegories, why he did the movies. And so you have to think. This whole thing that you see going on in our in our modern day era of the movement of transgender homosexual, this is one of the major reasons, other than the occult reasons and, of course, the sin factor. And then we have in X-Men Apocalypse, the last movie that came out, the villain Apocalypse was actually a caricature of Yahweh. This was said by Brian Singer, too. So the way that Apocalypse was defeated in the movie was by Jean Grey. Jean Grey didn't want to u- utilize her powers. She, she, it wasn't birthed yet, right? And so Professor X, by the end of the movie, tells her to basically open up. But when you realize that what she turns into is a phoenix, the phoenix is a representation of Satan, a Lucifer, the light bearer. And she helps to defeat Yahweh. Think about that. Think about what you sat down and watched. Yes, and, and and the other thing about like Chris said earlier, Jean Grey represents the phoenix, and what what does the phoenix normally represent? It represents the rebirth of something more powerful, and the, so the phoenix rises, and that's what Chris was mentioning in the movie. She comes and defeats Yahweh. Yes, mm-hmm. look at the Ouroboros, the snake eating eating its tail. Infinity, the infinity symbol. It's all the same thing. And, and this race of superheroes living in the background, that's a Jack Kirby idea 
And it's inspired stories like X-Men, the 4400, the hit series Heroes, and others. This reoccurring theme in the superhero TV series and others where you can't go to the police, you have to hide in the shadows because they won't understand who we are. And it also goes into the whole alien seed in the planet. We'll get into that in a second. Go ahead, Roy. It, it also goes to show that the populace shouldn't know the, the, the information. I want to read something here. Genesis 3, when the serpent beguiled Eve, he said to her, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doeth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. Now, this is the agenda that's being put forth. This is what Hollywood in general is trying to put forth in the movies, in the comics, like we're talking about today. And that's why it's the hidden knowledge. They don't want everybody to necessarily know you have to be a part. You have to be an initiate. You have to come in in order for you to know that. Oh, yes, definitely. Speaking of initiations, Rory, there are secret societies all over the comic book industry, all over, I mean, written in. We know that there used to be a Hellfire's Club. When in X-Men, one of their villains is the Hellfires Club. And so we see that parallel. We have another one called the Illuminati, which we have the Bavarian Illuminati, or some would say the Order, the Power Elite, the Establishment in Marvel Comics. It composes of Doctor Strange, Professor X, the Atlantean Prince Namor, Iron Man, Black Bolt, the leader of the Inhumans, and also Mr. Fantastic. This secret society is the one that's going to help to go against the uh, oncoming alien threats that the regular superheroes can't deal with. And they manage the superheroes of the world. Think about that idea that's there. And you, you're going to pick up this comic book that's blatantly representing Lucifer, the light bearer, the Illuminati. Think about that. While we are talking about some of the things about, about Marvel, or we look at Marvel comics in general, they have had such a, a long run with the movies that they've put out. And they have, their characters are so well developed today. And one of the things that we are, we are seeing in the movies today, we see MK Ultra that is being put forth. We see the mind control that's, that's going on in the movies. We see all sorts of other things. The super soldier, Captain America, also Deadpool. The entire history is what's being hidden in plain sight. We have Operation Paperclip where the, um, the scientists, were brought over here, they have become a part of today's society. So they, they have now assimilated with our society and using the dark arts, so to speak, to push the agenda forward, the order of the new age. Uh, exactly. And, you know, if you, you can go back to even Flash Gordon. When you go back and look at Flash Gordon, you see that the Earth is about to get destroyed by some meteor shower and he they fly a spaceship up into basically a parallel dimension and... When you look at some of the villains in this parallel dimension, they have Masonic symbolisms all over them. And there's a lot you can say about Flash Gordon, the lightning bolt and everything like that. But that's one of the old ones. You, you come to, you know, Doctor Strange, he's basically, no, with no doubt, a practitioner of the occult. On the DC side, there's Constantine that was made up by Alan Moore. Alan Moore says the words that they write is the magic. They yes. use that to change the consciousness of the people. Yes. This is what's going on. So anyone that doubts what I'm saying, go look up Alan Moore. You can find out what he says about his writings. This is a person that wrote V for Vendetta that everyone thinks is just something about going against the New World Order when it isn't. It's actually Satan training Eve to escape from the grip of God. And then he wrote Watchmen, all about the coming New World Order and the yeah. Superman. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the magic that they're talking about is mind control. Exactly. Witchcraft. Exactly. Coming straight from the shamanistic rituals and the new age and other train of thoughts. And it's straight out of the pit of hell. Um, the other thing that we, well, we looked at it, but idol worship, the mm, idol worship. Yeah. And like Chris said before, it's the image that is being cast in the mind, you see the image of God, the image of Christ is being removed and the image of these so-called superheroes, the Ubermensch, is being put forth. And if you think this new age thing is not 
in the movies, in, in Captain America, in one of the Captain America movies, there's a scene where Red Skull comes and he looks at a mural. And the mural has the tree, the tree of life. And he goes up to the, to the, the mural and he sees the serpent and he pushes the serpent's eyes. And that's where he gets that hidden knowledge. That's where he gets that power from. And the same power, the same satanic power, that he gets is the same satanic power that is being put in Captain America. So we see that he's taken from being the skinny soldier to a muscular, bulky super soldier, and it's being put forth. And he said in one of the, the scenes, he says, how did this, this spy from Hitler's days, how did he get here? It was Operation Paperclip that brought him over. And then in the other movie, The Winter Soldier, you see where mind control is used. And in one scene, the government agent who is over the entire operation comes in and he says, wipe him clean. So now you see that through this mind control, they're able to wipe a person's mind clean. The mind control that's going on, it's happening not only in the movie, but it's happening to us because it's trauma-based mind control, MK Ultra. This was started by Hitler, and it's it's being put in the movies and now to the society. Go ahead, Chris. Well, yes, the, the the guy that shot up the airport in Florida and killed five people. He said he went to the FBI and said that he was being being shown Al Qaeda footage night and day, and, and so. You have to think about that. Why would they show them that? What is in the Al Qaeda videos? Nothing but violence and blood and and grotesque, you know, whatever. And you think about this is a revelation that came to me the other night. I was just thinking, and the thought just came to me: when you go to the movies and you get such intense violence all the time, it's traumatic mind control because we 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 just suck up all of this violence. In these movies, not just superhero movies, a lot of other movies too, and TV shows. And so, I just want to, you know, jump from that and, and read an excerpt from this book, um, "The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow" by Candace Cumby. And this is not, this is before the, it, it even gets into any of the meat. It says, although the rainbow seems to be only a colored arc of light refracted through raindrops, for Christians and New Ages, had it has a deep meaning. According to the Bible, the rainbow is, is a symbol of God's everlasting covenant that he would never again destroy the earth by a flood. However, the New Age uses rainbows to signify their building on the rainbow bridge, Anta Karana, between man and Lucifer, who they say is the oversoul. And so you, you see the connections there from what I just read, from the mind control and everything else. Well, you know what's interesting? You just said flood, and the flood came because, let's face it, the whole world had degenerated into this zoo, this morphology of corruption. And so when you look at why God wiped it out the first time, well, the DNA, the Nephilim, the giant, what happened when the 200 watchers came. I mean, if it's not eugenics and genetics, that's a theme in all these Marvel comics, too, is, you know, you just mentioned, of course, Captain America, the super soldiers, mutants in X-Men, these transgenic mutants. It really fits into that as well, doesn't it? Oh, definitely, definitely. Absolutely. Um, you go into, there's a comic book called Earth X, and I'm going to try to keep this one short. I know we don't have much time, but um, there's a robot. He's on the moon. There's a watcher there, and he's telling the robot that he needs to basically get rid of his humanity. Well, why was a robot have, have humanity? Well, it's an allegory for the human soul. Give him, him a description of history, and he's, he's telling him that this ancestral... Um, race came and seeded the planet. They germinated the planet. And now within the human race, well, back then, they, they, as evolution goes, that would be the Neanderthals and everything. And out of them came the god Thor and Hercules and every other, you know, demigod. And so from there, it goes on to say that by the, like the 80s, 90s, places like that, the timeline, it started germinating again. And that's where you start to get the Spider-Mans and the Wolverines. And then mm -hmm. further into the future, it basically told you that most of the planet became superheroes and they got lazy. They didn't have anything to do until the threat came. And so this is this whole transgenic, transhumanism, post-humanism, genetically modified babies. That's where all of this comes in. And that, that we could break that down in 28 different ways. 
Well, and let me throw this out there. You know, the Nor- when I think of Thor and the Norse trickster god Loki banished from Asgard, of course, forming an alliance at the race known as the Chatari. If you actually really look into the organization designated S.H.I.E.L.D., of course, led by Nick Fury, collects a band of superhuman defenders to meet the Chatari invasion. Well, who are the Chatari? Well, guess what, folks? In Marvel comic lore, the Chitauri are a race of shape-shifting subjugates, and it's really frightening how this ties in with Shiva, the Destroyer. What are they doing at CERN, opening Gods of the Ages? Boy, this stuff fits in, doesn't it? Yes. And here's, an, here's, here's something interesting I want to touch before we get to the end. Uh, many people don't know that Transformers came from the comic books. If you go back to the first Transformers movie, there's something in there called a cube. It's the AllSpark. And you hear Optimus Prime narrating, saying, before time began, there was the cube. Right. And he goes and says how the cube basically formed life. But wait a minute. That goes against the biblical narrative. That goes against everything we believe about who God is and what he says in his book, the Holy Bible. And so you have to think, wait a minute. These robotic entities that are living machines, basically, their soul comes from the spark which it goes back to the Kabbalah, which is the spark of, wait a minute, God, so to speak. You, you know, we could break this down so much, but the thing is, you have to listen and take notes and go research intently to find out the truth yeah. for yourself. And Chris, um, the most important thing is that they're take, trying to take the word of God and remove the word of God and put what they want to put there so that at the end, just like in, in, in the Masonic Lodge, you find that you're actually worshiping the enemy or you're worshiping Satan. You're being deceived. You're being duped. It's just a total lie. Mm-hmm. Speaking of a lie, Rory, let's go back to Doctor Strange again. Doctor Strange, just like Batman and a couple other superheroes, went to the, the Tibet to get their training, right, from uh, Ascended Masters. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is a... A, a part in Doctor Strange by the end of the movie, you see him have, you see him form some type of, let's just call it a watch, a ring around his his, his, his wrist, and he's attempting to stop this uh, demonic force from invading Earth through guess what, a portal, and the entity kills him, and then he takes the loop, and turns it backwards, and then the entity kills him again, and then he takes the loop and does it again, and it's and it's over and over and over again, until the demonic entity is like, stop, what are you doing? And he says, we can do this for eternity. Well, let me tell you where that concept comes from. It comes from Hinduism and Buddhism, where it tells you that you are born perfect, but somewhere along the line, you messed up. And so now you have to be reincarnated right. as a flea, as a bee or whatever, until you get it right. And that's why these rich billionaire Hindus sit around and don't do anything for the poor people because they're basically filth. They need to get it right. That's where this idea comes from. And so I just wanted to say that about Dr. Strange. It is stunning the correlation of how many of these people are summoning demons. Alice Alice Bailey, who wrote the 24 volumes of the cult, she said that she got her information on all this new age occult from her ascended master. You can go back to, again, it winds into Aunt LaVey, Alistair Crowley. It just goes on and on how many demons these people summon. I was surprised in Dr. Strange Actually, Chris, when he walked into the library and he asks for the Book of Solomon and the Kabbalah, I just did a show and how it ties into Israel and the Antichrist, but it is stunning. The Kabbalah is essentially the religion of the Antichrist. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, it's it's all over. In, in the uh, Marvel pantheon, the DC pantheon, you'll see Kabbalah. They take a mixture of everything, just like how New Age is a cafeteria religion. They take bits and pieces, even of Christianity, to make it seem like all roads lead to God. And that's what this this idea is also, that you can have this God or that God or the Mitsuplex, which is the, the little imp from another universe. You can have a Superman, Wolverine, who is a, the um, immortal, but his, his, his body, his hum, human body, it has a healing factor, but he can't die. Well, and you know, the other theme I find so fascinating woven into all this, guys, is the fact that it's always the metallurgy, the alchemy. And that ties back in with the watchers that came down and mated, you know, the transgenic hybrid creations, the Nephilim, 
ties into the Aryan race, ties into the demons that Hitler said he met this race of Aryan demons. It's always interesting because alchemy, metallurgy, silver surfer, Wolverine and his, you know, Captain America has his shield. You know, that's a theme that weaves into this too. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, you'll, you'll see that adamantium is what helps Wolverine to survive the violent onslaught from his foes. You, you go and you go and you look at um, Flash from the DC universe. He is the god of alchemy, Hermes, right? And so, wait a minute. He uses the speed to, that's his superpower, his speed, right? The accident that happened was a flash of lightning onto some chemicals that fell on his body. And then he becomes a speedster. Now, there are more than one speedsters, right? One of the episodes in the um, the TV series show that he lost his powers, and then he had to go inside of the speed force to find out what's going on. And these entities are in there, and they're talking to him, and they're telling him that he has to catch his shadow and all this other stuff, right? But it turns out that they granted him that power, these gods, right? And you take away speed from force, and what do you have? Force. The right. force. Right. It's the same Hinduistic Buddhism concept. Well, Yoda that... Yoda was a Zen master. Come on now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this whole force thing is found in Star Wars and other uh, comic book series, too. It just might not be called the same thing. Again, it's the light and the dark, which goes into witchcraft, where you have white magic and black magic. It, this stuff gets so fascinating. But at the same time, are people studying the word of God? Exactly. Are, 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 they, are they really honoring God in what they do? I'm not legalistic about anything. I'm not telling anyone to watch or read or listen to what I say. But think about what God is telling you in your heart. Are you submitting yourself to pagan ideas? And not only that, but loving it. Are you honoring God? Because when Man of Steel came out, I was ready. To, I saw it four times before, you know, two weeks were, were out. And I was ready to tell my friends about it and people I haven't talked about in a while. And something just hit me in the heart and said, are you telling them about Jesus or Superman? And I never called anyone after that came into my heart. So we have to honor God in everything that we do. And again, I'm not telling you what to watch. It's not like I won't go and see Justice League just to see what's in it. See, my intent is different from the next person. I'm going to see what they put in there. The other person is going to go, yay, Superman is saving the world or whoever, the Justice League. But, you know... At the end of a lot of this, what you're going to see is the portals open. The enemy comes down that, that, that are godlike. And the gods of the earth are going to go and stop that threat. Well, if you don't know what the threat really is, the allegory is they're going to cancel the apocalypse. Exactly. They're going to cancel the revelation of Jesus Christ who came and died for your sins. He was going to come back as a righteous king and declare his glory. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The kings of the earth will turn their weapons on Jesus. That's in the Bible. And these stories are showing you what they're going to do. Trust me, that's what it is. Well, and then there's a real theme. And the theme of all of this ties into what you said, witchcraft, idolatry, and rebellion. There's paralleling the great controversy between Jesus and Satan, I say, could these allegories be misleading counterfeits of the great true way of salvation and redemption? Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. And Sheila, we talked about this new age agenda that's being put forth. Not only is it in the comics, but it, it goes to every area of our society. The Super Bowl, for instance, we they have the people, these guys are, are helping to forth another side, another dimension to this whole entire image that we are seeing that's in the comics, in the movies, and, you know, people are, are running with it. People are picking it up. Let's not forget the Grammys. Let's not forget the Olympics. <laughs> everything. I mean, everything. It's, yeah, yeah. And, you know, guys, I want to mention also, since a lot of people don't know, that The Walking Dead came mm, out of a comic That's so popular, book. yeah. It came out of a comic book. And what, what it's showing you now, remember, in the story, the zombies are not the walking dead. It's the people. No, the zombies the are the guys in my town lined up for flu shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's the people. And the people are just killing each other to survive. Yeah. That's an allegory for what's going on today. When calamity comes, you're going to be killing each other to survive. 
the zombie is just another spiritual subject to tackle another time, you know, but that's what's going on in The Walking Dead. And and it's very popular. The zombie thing is very popular, but that's, it came out of comic books. Like you guys said, this ties back in the, not just The Walking Dead and this zombified apocalypse, this glazed look. I mean, this is real life A&E Walking Dead, the people that are in this dystopic fog that don't know what's going on. And it really ties in, again, to MKUltra, to mind control, the beta, the theta waves that are pumping out through movies, the subliminal messaging. I mean, look at Harry Potter is teaching our kids, little kids, to cast spells. Oh, that's so trendy. (laughs) You know, you know, Sheila, you said something a while ago. You talked about this casting of the spell somewhere in the New Testament. um, I think it was in the book of Galatians. It says, who has bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? I mean, who has come in and done such a thing to you? And one of the things we are talking about, Chris and I, the other day, we were talking about what happened in the year of 2016. And we saw for the first time that the media on a whole, they were saying, and I, and I have to go to the election, they were saying, hey, this guy Trump, he's definitely going to lose. They were putting forth an image in people's minds. And what happened? When it was reversed or he won, people were shocked. They couldn't, what happened? How did it happen? But you see, one of the things that they're, they're doing, they've been lying to people all along. And it's not only in the news that you're hearing. It happens in the theater. When you sit down, you have these guys that are contacting demons in the movies that they are giving them their entire script. And they're putting the script to us or giving it in the form of a movie, movie and putting it to full life on the big screen. And people are taking it and running with it. That's yes. very dangerous. Well, and, true. Look, and look at Elijah said at the showdown of the prophets of Baal. He called them out and said, hey, you you call on the name of your gods. But I'll tell you what, we have a super savior, folks. We have a superhero <laughs> and his name is Jesus Christ. And we know that we've always been at the crosshairs of Satan's deception. It started in the garden. We we went full circle on this show. You will become as gods. Oh, don't worry about what he said, that big tyrannical god he said oh you're gonna surely die no you're not relax it's always undermining god these replacement gods in spandex as i call them it's amazing how it has completely infiltrated every video game every movie every tv show our kids are getting a 24 7 cornucopia of this very malevolent indoctrination and that is the problem isn't it oh yes definitely and and if you notice um if you take a really close look at what, what Hollywood or uh, Disney has has done, you know, buying out Marvel and basically they're the ones leading yes. Hollywood right now. And Hollywood has to go to what used to be shunned at. The comic books used to be shunned at. They, they were thought of as just literary mess. And they got banned and all these things back in the day. And now the, with the resurgence where Hollywood has to go to the comic book writers to get the good movies the action movies of today. You're, you're right. About that. You're right, Chris. Mm-hmm. But remember, not only Marvel has gone to um, Disney, but Star Wars, they're getting ready now to bombard us with so much filth. It's mm-hmm. going to be coming at the children so much. Remember now, Disney, um, how could we forget the Musketeers? Look at <laughs> this, a lot of the Musketeers that are out there and how they have turned out. Most of them are druggies that we see today. This is what's coming at us. And they have taken over. They're taking over a lot of these different areas to make these so-called great movies in their eyes. Well, it's a magical kingdom, all right, where they do use magic, but it's not benevolent. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, guys. You just, I mean, you're right. We could probably spend a whole two weeks doing just a breakdown of all this. But, you know, again, it's just so important to kind of make some of these connections. And who knows, maybe we'll do a part two of some of the characters we could. I mean, because there's so much to the, like you said, it's straight from the pit of hell. You know, I mean, it's just so much information to get into. But you guys really did a good job today of laying this out. And I, I really hope you come back for like a part two of this excellent information. And I know you guys really, you know your stuff, and I thank you both for coming on the program today, guys. Oh, thanks for having us. It would be honored to come back. 
Thank you. We would love to. And just in the waning moments, Chris, give out your information, how folks can check out your handiwork. Oh, you can check us out on www.dontletthemburn.com. You can also find us on YouTube, on Twitter. There's a new uh, YouTube sort of site. It's called vid.me. We just got on there. You can find us there. And just send us any questions. Even if you disagree, send us a message. Um, and, and if this has touched you and has helped you go in a better direction towards Jesus Christ, let us know too. And that's how you can find us. Well, folks, there you have it. Don't let them burn.com. I want to thank you, Chris and Roy, for coming on the program. Folks, the information is bookmark there today. Again, reach out to them. Let them know you heard them on the program and make sure you share the video and remember to like and subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget, go to weekendvigilante.com and up at the top right on the pink bar, you will see the social media icons. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning into the broadcast today. Good night and God bless.